Josh Foster. One oh five. Uh, Francisco. One. G, row G, is that right? Row G. Alexandria. There you are. One, two, three, two. Oh, yeah, Alexandria, 103. Sonia, go, man. Michael, Michael, uh, Nicholas, oh. Three. Uh, 27. Alexia, yeah, Ro G, same, yep, uh, Nicole. Andrea Hernandez. Sierra Hernandez. Uh, Meredith. Meredith. Katie Holland. Katie? Andrea Jimenez. Amy Johnson. Zach Johnson. Zach? Jaden Johnston. Jaden, Will Jones, Will, are you at the end, or is there a, uh, to your right, yep, uh, Madison Kaiser, uh, Lindsay, Joshua Luter. Elijah. Juan Martinez. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Where's that? Juan Hernandez? Ah, okay, okay. Juan Martinez, that's 43. 43, and then Juan Garcia. Is that, are you row F? Yep. Mariah Martinez? Ryan Matchek. Brianna. One oh seven. David McDaniel. Paula. 110, thank you. Giselle Mendoza. Uh, 
Logan Mears. Ambria. Ambria. Uh, Leanne. Mon Leanne Montel. One, two, three, four, six. Lewis Morales. Uh, 103. 103. Thank you. Uh, Valerie, no more. One hundred five. Ian Morrow. One twelve. Thank you. Anthony. Marissa. Marissa, Northern. Braylon. Uh, Chloe Patton. Wyatt, Paul. Hudson, you're in 112, correct? It's that seat next to you is throwing me off. It looks like it's two. Victoria Perez. Cole. Xavier. Sydney. Uh, Desiree. 105. Is that correct? Amy. Amy. Madison, San Miguel. Jenna. Thank you. Kaylin Stevens. Nolan. Nolan. Janelle, 104, thank you. Megan Torres, Megan. Uh, Serena. Mercedes. Natalie, Natalie. All right, let's go one more, one more time. Uh, Caroline. Alex. Sophia. I already had, I did mark you off. Vivian. Annie. Uh, Michael Gomez. Row H, looks like. Is that correct? Yep. Uh, Sierra Hernandez. Sierra? Meredith. Zach Johnson. Oh. Hmm. 
I think I missed your hand last time. Okay. Uh, Jaden Johnson. David McDaniel. Uh, Ambria. Nolan. Janelle. Janelle. Thomas. Yeah, I didn't mark you off. Yeah, no. I've got you down on paper. Uh, Megan Torres. Uh, Natalie Villanueva. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I'm seeing people on the chat. Uh, those of you, I think everyone that was here can see me doing it. I'm right now what seat you're in, just in case we have contact tracers contact me. Please, Maine and... I can update the chart, all right, update the chart. And they did a pretty good job. I added the spaces, these extra spaces in the rows to help me count. Um, and it also is actually pretty easy for me just to kind of go through and see if people are sitting in the seats. So I don't have to call names all the time. I can just see, yeah, um, you know, Nicholas, right? I can see, you know, oh, the seat empty. I just write down the number. So if any, if a contact tracer looks at me and says, "Hey, is Nicholas was Nicholas in class today?" I can go to my lat that list, figure out what number he is, what number alphabetical, anyways, and we'll see if the numbers are there. So it just speeds things up a little bit easier, uh, and we're with the contact tracers. Everyone that's online, when you do come to class, just let me know, like, let me know where you're sitting, so that way I can I can get you added to the chart. And again, just for the contact tracers, um, they are schools still doing it. Skills, schools still contacting people, so um, which is probably a good thing. Lets you know if someone, someone around you tested positive. All right. Uh, that being said, vaccination clinic I guess is today. The first one is today. Uh, if you haven't had your vaccine, go. I encourage you to get it. Uh, there may be there, there may be side effects. Mine was a sore arm. Uh, everyone's going to respond a little bit differently, but uh, something you can recommend. I'd recommend. All right. Oh, hold on. I didn't mark these down. All right, so we had uh, so we had Maddie Kaiser is here. We've got uh, Paul David McDaniel is here. Have uh, Megan Torres is here. And I saw Paul McDaniel. Is that right? Let's see here. Oh yeah, no, that's David. David McDaniel's here. Uh, Logan Mears is here. Marked. I already have Megan uh, and Ambria. All right. All right. So, do you have any questions over material that was covered? Oh, we've got one, one more came in. All right, 
You in the back, red shirt. What's your name? McDaniel? Okay. Uh, are you going to be sitting there? Yeah, are you going to be sitting there? All right. Is that the seat on the end? All right. All right. Let's get rolling. Any questions over the material so far? Hopefully, it's self explanatory. So, this is where we left off methods of ecology. All right, we talked about reductionism versus holism. That's our approach to kind of wrangle the complexity of systems, the complexity of the interaction. So, we can reduce it down and study individual interactions uh, one by one and then try to piece together the, in the entire system to explain the functioning of that system or we can study the, the entire system, less so about the uh, individual interactions, but we're interested in you know, what happens if we change one thing, what's the end result in our system? So there's you know, some benefits, there's downsides of each. Probably the biggest downside of reductionism is that you're going to miss out on those emergent properties. Or you're going to miss out on some of those interactions uh, that only occur when we step back and look at other interactions at, and other organisms in that system. All right. As we do these experiments, a lot of the things that we do is going to be observational in nature. Yes, we can make some changes. Make, maybe we can follow fluctuating temperatures and then make conclusions based on those fluctuating temperatures, but a lot of times we are not manually adjusting those temperatures. All right, and this sets up a, a, a situation where even though temperature is changing it, we didn't cause that. So anything that results from that change in temperature isn't going to be something that we can say, well, that was caused by the temperature change. Because all that we saw was a correlation. And correlation in and of itself does not imply causation. All right, so we've got different types of correlation. You can have a situation where there is no correlation. So this is a graph. We have some variable on the x-axis, maybe temperature. We've got some variable on the y-axis, maybe, let's say, uh, metabolic rate. All right, if temperature and metabolic rate are independent of each other, then we're, we'll see no correlation. As temperature increases, our metabolic rate could increase, could decrease. It's just a random change. And if we try to do a best fit line, we get basically a flat line. If they're related, if temperature increases, if our metabolic rate increases as our temperature increases, we call that a positive correlation. Is it a, did temperature cause that increase? No, nope, it doesn't have to be. That's just a correlation. If metabolic rate decreases as temperature increases, we have a negative correlation. So if one increases and the other also increases, that's positive correlation. If one increases and the other decreases, that's a negative correlation. And again, a lot of times in ecology, these are just observations. The only way we get to that causation is to manually manipulate one of these variables. So if we manipulate temperature and say, we're going we're to put you into a hot box, into a sauna, and measure your metabolic rate, and we see that increase, OK, that's looking good. And then we take you out and put you in, in a cold room, a uh, cold storage room, and your metabolic rate decreases. What we have just now done is demonstrated causation. As we change the external temperature, we cause a change in our metabolic rate. That's causation. But if we don't have that manual change, it's, you can't infer that causation. Great example is if we plot the number of pirates as a function of a global average, global average temperature. Now, the number of pirates is reversed. That scale is reversed. So if you go right, you have fewer pirates. If you go left, you've got more pirates. So as the number of pirates in the world went down, our global temperature increased. Was our global average temperature, is that caused by the pirates? Change in the number of pirates? No, it's a, it's a correlation, kind of an interesting correlation. But the number of pirates in the world didn't 
cause the change in our, in our global temperatures. So again, be warned, correlation does not infer causation. The one other point, one other, I'm going to say, common theme in, in ecology is contingency. Contingency is, dis, is defined as this. The result, what we see, the result, is a different realization of the same underlying processes affected by local conditions. The result is a different realization of the same underlying processes affected by local conditions. In layman's terms, what we see is entirely dependent on where we start and everything around it. So here's an, here's an example, maybe not the best example, but it's an example. You're an undergraduate student, you want to do research, all right? We go out and we're interested in recording primary production in, a, in an aquatic system, all right? So you go out, you're doing, aquatic, you're doing production in an aquatic system, and you're doing this, you, we have, let's say, years of data. And in that years of data, we've measured the production and we have species richness, number of species. So you go to your first lake, Green Lake, and when we plot that information, we see we get a positive correlation. So right now, it looks like there's some sort of relationship between the number of species in our system and the production of that lake, the primary, productive, the primary productivity. That's great. Presented your research, maybe did a poster at the ASU Research Symposium, and then you say, I want to continue this because this is just one lake. We need to actually demonstrate that this is a, a you know, common theme or a common occurrence. So then you sign up as a master's student. We also have a second data point, second lake called Bear Lake. And you did the same thing. You recorded this information. But this time when you plotted it, you get this horizontal line. So before you go talk to your, your major advisor, you're at a quandary, and you start asking your, college, your, your fellow grad students and say, hey, what's going on? Maybe I missed something. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I keyed it in wrong in, in my data sheet. They look at it and say, nope, that looks right. So we went from undergrad research that showed a positive relationship to graduate research, which showed no relationship. And you, you decide, you know what? Maybe I just, I'm, I'm, maybe something's wrong. Maybe this is a polluted lake. Let's try to go back to a lake that is more, that is closer to Green Lake. So you delay graduation, stay an extra year, you have the data for a second, or for a third lake, and this time you get a negative correlation. Now you're just completely, you throw up your hands and you're like, this is, I, I quit, this, this stinks. All right, your major advisor looks at you, says, hey, that's, could be expected. Why? because the result, our relationship is entirely dependent on the exact conditions of the lake. Are each of the lakes identical? No, they're not. They're gonna be slightly different. They can be slightly different in their soil composition, slightly different in uh, the, the shape of the, of the bowl, of the, of the lake, all right? Could be slightly different in which species are there. Could be slightly different in the location and exposure to wind and exposure to sun. All of those factors ultimately have an effect on what we see, what kind of relationship we see. We say that these results then are conditioned on the actual factors, the actual items in our lake, the, the specifics of our lake. All right, same thing would, be, would happen if we set up a series of aquaria. All right, we get 10 gallon tanks, we get 20 of them, we measure the water exactly, precisely, not only with a graduated cylinder, but we weigh it as well to make sure we have the exact same amount of water. We measure all of our parameters, exact same water parameters, and then we let it sit. 
at the end of that waiting period, when we go back and look at each of those aquariums, each one is going to be unique because we couldn't account for differences in the glass. We couldn't account for the location in their room. Right here, I have a breeze hitting me. I can feel the airflow. If I move over here, I don't. Those minor changes are going to have an effect on that end product of our system. That's contingency in ecology. So how do we deal with it? In ecology, we have to start looking at the bigger picture. We have to start assembling all of the data around the world to come up with some general themes, general theories. Can't even call them laws, because laws apply no matter what. So what we do is something called a meta-analysis. All right, we collect the results of numerous research studies and we look for patterns. So let's say then you finished here, I, you know, your, your major advisor says, hey, let's be done, we found some differences, let's write it up, let's get you out. And you say, you know what, I'm just not satisfied. So you, know, you basically stabbed yourself in the hand, applied to graduate school, and you're going for your PhD. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you did it. All right? In that PhD, you continue this research, but now you started contacting colleagues, you started reaching out, meet friends. They started doing all the work for you, sampling the lakes all around the world, leading to this graph. So what this graph is, is it's the same type of graph, primary production on the y-axis, number of species on the x-axis, but now each of these lines and points represents a single lake, and it's representing the correlation in that lake. So some of the lakes have positive correlation. Some of the lakes have negative co correlation, some more than others. Some of them have no correlation between production and number of species. But what we get is when we start plotting these lakes, these averages, average productivity, average species richness on a plot, we get this overall theme that says, yeah, generally speaking, if we increase the number of species in a system, we can increase the production of that system. Is that a law? No. Each lake is unique due to contingency in ecology. But generally speaking, if we increase the number of species, we increase primary production. This came about from a meta-analysis, and this is one way in which we can address that contingency issue that we have, where everything is going to be dependent on the specifics of the system. Questions? So ecology works just like any other science, experimental methods. But we have some unique systems. Very rarely, you know, you, you can't do like genetic studies where you take a wide-eyed fly and a red-eyed fruit fly, mate them, and say, well, sometimes they'll come out red-eyed, sometimes they come out wide-eyed. It's just what temperature they're, they're being raised at or whatever. You can't really say that in, in some genetic studies. You can't knock out a gene and say, well, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's either you knocked out the gene or you didn't. Ecology is different. Ecology has some problems that we have to get around, and we have to deal with it. All right, ecology is filled with math. It's filled with statistics. There's no, no getting around it. The field has moved in that direction. All right, and it's important because a lot of these interactions, a lot of the, these systems are really complex, and it's hard to tease things out. And this is where math, this is where statistical analysis comes into play. We can look at our data, and we can use statistical techniques to extract those interactions that we're interested in. And in many ways, we can often control for all of the variation that's out there to get at our specific interaction of interest. Now, the statistical approach is mostly reductionist in nature. It's mostly reductionist in nature. And we use that, this approach, to try to quantify interaction. So instead of just saying, I'm going to flip back the slide, instead of just saying, yeah, we've got this positive increase, this positive correlation, someone can ask you, well, how much of an effect will there be if we add two, four, eight more species to the system? It's not enough to say, well, we'll increase it. They want to know by how much. 
And this is where statistics help to answer that question. So here's an example. We're interested in population uh, or predation rates uh, by wolves on moose. All right. So we know wolves eat moose. They hunt, they hunt them, they kill them, they eat them. But we also know that the wolves will occasionally take rabbits, hares. So how much of an impact does hares have on predation rates of moose? So what you can do is go out and do, do an experiment. And again, best would be some sort of experimental manipulation. Set up a fence where you can exclude hares or uh, you know, make an enclosure where you introduce hares in there. But what we do is we have number of moose on the x-axis. We have predation rate, you know, how many of them get eaten um, over a set amount of time. And when we don't have any rabbits, this is our best fit line. And when we do our best fit, we get our equation that says our slope is 4. So for every increase in moose, we have an increase in predation rate of 4, whatever that rate is. Maybe 4 moose per year is the increase. Maybe it's 4 moose per month. Who knows? It's just generic rate. When we introduce hairs, we also get a best fit line. Now, our slope is 1.25. Right. Mathematically, statistically, this, these are the numbers that we came up with. So for each, for each additional moose that we have, our predation rate is 1.25, where we increase the rate by 1.25. So you know, again, maybe that's 1.25 moose per year more that are consumed with each additional one that's added. Now our interest is, what's the effect of the rabbits? This is where the numbers come into play. We can look at these numbers and say, wow, when, when, when rabbits are absent, we have almost uh, a three times increase in predation rate. We've got a more than doubling of the predation rate. So what's the effect of rabbits? It eases predation pressure. It eases predation rates. And we added numbers to that. More than just a qualitative description, we've numerically quantified that. And that's, that's, our, that's our statistics. Any questions on here? So again, I kind of put in our conclusions that we could derive from the graph. So predation rate increases as moose populations increase. That's our positive correlation. and then. Predation rate increases more when the hairs are absent, and it's actually three times more, or a little more than three times more. So that's the statistical side of things. We can also use math to make models. And the mathematical models are mostly holistic. Now what we're trying to do is create this model that describes the functioning of the entire system. It's not just this relationship. It's all of the other relationships that we're dealing with. So we need to know, hey, what is the predation rate on the hares themselves? Right? How does that change with the quantity? How does that change uh, with weather and so forth? All right, so these models are a set of equations. They're aimed at describing the operation of, of, of the system. An example of one of these models is the lotka volterra models. These are predator-prey equation models that model the change in predation uh, the change in predator population size as our prey population size changes. So what this gives us is predictions. When we look at these models together, what we would see is this type of cyclical pattern where through time, as our when our prey populations are high, we get an increase in our predator populations. But as our predator populations increase, we increase predation rates, killing off more prey, causing that population to decline. As we have fewer and fewer prey items, our predators respond because some of them are going to starve and they die, so they drop off. All right, And it's just in this cycle that, would, that this model predicts. Now, this is a simple, simplified version of this. All right. This is a simplified version of predator and prey population size. Why would we simplify it? Why would, why would we make it this simple? 
Well, there's two main reasons. One, we don't know what else is out there. We don't know what other interactions are important. So if we don't know what other interactions are important, we just leave them out. The second side of it is that the actual system is so complex that we lack the computing power to actually solve those equations. Or in some cases, maybe we lack the data needed to input into the computer to actually perform our simplification, our estimates. All right, so the lock of Volterra model, these are the equations, right? We've got basically the rates. We have our, our victim. It's our prey. V is our victim. Uh, alpha is conversion. If they actually interact, if they contact each other, what's the likelihood that, that it actually gets consumed? And it's related to this one, to the beta, which is the capture efficiency. All right. And then you have natural rates of death. Yeah, RV. and So RV is like your intrinsic rate of growth. What's the standard growth rate? And then you subtract out those that, that get killed. So we really are just dealing with standard growth rates and risk of being captured and eaten uh, for the victim. And then for the predator, it's basically how good they are at capturing and converting that energy into offspring and then just natural mortality rates. We've left off everything else. We've left off diseases. You could say, well, diseases are included in our natural mortality rate, but disease dynamics tell us that as we increase population sizes, you increase the risk of disease transmission. So we've ignored that. We've ignored a lot of other things. We've ignored the effect of, of weather on food supplies that would have naturally affected our, our prey items. So we've simplified our system, but at a cost of accuracy. So what's wrong with this model itself? In real life, it doesn't do this. In real life, it doesn't do this. When, it, when researchers try to get this, demonstrate this cycle, both of them crash. Both of them crash, they go extinct. They had to keep increasing, increasing the complexity of the system just to try to get a couple cycles, and then it crashed. Crashed again. So simplification, sometimes you have to do it, but the downside is that we reduce the accuracy of our predictions. How problematic are these two things? It all depends on what your overall goal is. All right? It all depends on what your overall goal is. So if we're looking at general knowledge, if we're just interested in generally what happens, then we can simplify because we don't really need the specifics. We just need to know, hey, you know, what, what's the generality? Right? What's the general response? We can say it's going to increase or it's going to decrease. Or we can say, it, you know, maybe it fluctuates a little bit. That's all qualitative in nature. We didn't have to say by how much. Right? And the other side, maybe we just are interested in the essential functions, in which case we only need general knowledge. We don't need the specifics. So in that case, we can sacrifice accuracy to make things a little bit easier, a little bit more manageable to study. But if we're in a position where we're making predictions for, let's say, management purposes, then we better be correct. We better be accurate. All right. If we need to say, you know, if you get called because you're managing a ranch and, and your boss says, hey, we need to increase the number of deer in our system, you need to know how to do that. You need to be able to... to accurately predict that because if you don't and you make a change and say yeah this should happen using my simplified model this should show an increase and you're wrong what's going to happen you're fired all right so if we're aiming for accuracy because we must be correct then don't simplify we need it as complex as possible so that we can make the, these sorts of informative decisions. Now, these mathematical models are great. 
They are used all throughout science, but they all have shortcomings. The first one is that they're usually untestable. We, we create that ma mathematical model uh, to predict you know, what happens to a, a deer population out at a ranch, all right? And we'd say, yeah, if we, you know, if we eliminate this species, we should increase, increase deer, deer production. A lot of times, it's gonna be unethical to do that or impossible to do that. I mean, you take you know, a 10,000 acre ranch, are you gonna be able to eliminate all of the, let's say, rabbits out there? Probably not. All right, so the model just basically becomes a hypothesis. It just becomes a hypothesis. Now what we can do is kind of follow, do some correlational analysis. Go out there, measure populations, and, and come up and say, okay, well this changes. Did our model make those predictions based on these changes, yes or no? Is it causation? No, because we didn't manipulate it. It's only correlation. So we have to recognize that many of the models are untestable. The other thing, and I think this could also be a problem, is this thing called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. The models are only as good as the data that we, that we give it. If we give it crap data, we're gonna get crap responses. Simple as that. All right, so if you're interested in deer management, you better have good data, because if you don't, your answers are meaningless. Questions? All right, so this is the end of our introduction. The quiz should have gone live. I didn't get notification, but I bet if I, if I do, if I check. Uh, come on. I have to check, it should have gone live. Did you get a notice from Blackboard? All right, should have gone live. This quiz is 15 minutes. You got three attempts at it. Due date is end of the day on Monday, so 11.30. Uh, I'm gonna use those due dates. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna use those due dates um, so that if you open up Blackboard, I guess on a calendar, it'll say this is what's due. I didn't know that. You can thank a graduate student uh, last year for informing me. So uh, if I forget to put a due date, please email me on there. Normally I give the due date on the assignment, I announce it in class, uh, but to actually specify the due date in my Blackboard options, that's what I'm talking about. No, it should have went live at 8.30, so I must not have checked the option to make it available. Uh, I will do that right now. Yep, item is hidden. Uh, make available. All right, so it should be available. All right, the quiz, 10 minutes, I believe. I think I, I don't know, let me check the time. 10 minutes. It's 10 minutes allowed for that time. Don't dawdle as you work on these, all right? I don't, it's not meant to have an unlimited amount of time for you to find the answers in your notes. The purpose of this is to get you in the notes and review, all right? Because when you come in for the lecture exam, you're not gonna, you've got that hour, that's it. We have that 50 minutes, we start, I'll try to get here a little bit earlier, uh, so we can start at 10 till, but we have to be out of here. There's a class after us. So this is meant to get into your notes, take the quiz, get it done in, a, get it done in that 10 minute time span, all right? These types of questions that you'll see will be similar to the types of questions that you'll see on the, on the lecture exam, all right? Due date is Monday, 11.30 at night. Basically, all of my quizzes that I post, I make it at 11.30 at night. With the due date, I believe if you start it before 
but then submit it after 11.30, it'll get marked as being late. Don't worry about it. I can see when you did it, all right? But we had checked the syllabus. I do have the late policy because I'm not releasing the keys until everyone has taken it or at least two days before our lecture exam. So if everyone takes this by, by Monday, you know, by the end of the day on Monday, I come in on Tuesday, see, yep, everyone's taking it. I'm making the key available at that time. All right? This isn't you take it once by, 11th, by Monday, and then you've got two other times to take it. All three attempts. All three attempts by that time. All right. After that, I also get to see the other, the second and third attempts on when you take it. If those are late, late, we we won't count those. All right. Those are out. So I do have the presentations. This lecture is broken down by presentations. We have quizzes basically after every presentation. We have quizzes after some problem sets. So as we get into population growth. Uh, Hardy-Weinberg stuff, I have some quizzes there as like practice problems give you, pra give you practice doing these types of problems in like a, I guess some of you would say a high stress situation if you have to do it on an exam, that type of situation, just to kind of demonstrate that you know how to do it. All right, so what we'll do is we'll be done. Uh, we will start with our evolution and adaptation on Monday. Vaccine clinic here on campus, I encourage you to get it and uh, stay safe.